part of the chapter that I wanted to begin with is in verse number, find my place here, verse number 8. Now, of course, this chapter contains the famous passage on the virtuous woman in verses 10 through 31. But in verse number 8, the Bible reads, Open thy mouth for the dumb, in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. And what I want to preach about tonight is the subject of abortion. Because apparently this weekend is a weekend that people use to commemorate the uh, Roe versus Wade decision that made abortion unilaterally legal in our country in uh, 1973. And apparently the anniversary of that is tomorrow. And so in honor of that, I'm going to preach this sermon tonight about abortion. And tonight I'm opening my mouth for the dumb, those who cannot speak, in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction, the unborn and the newborn babies that are slaughtered through uh, uh, abortion and other means. Uh, they don't have a voice to defend themselves or to cry out today, but as Abel's blood, after he was dead, cried out from the earth, their blood cried out as well. Now, I'll be honest with you, go to Ecclesiastes chapter number 11. Honestly, I'm not going to play games in this sermon, so just buckle your seatbelt, because I'm going to just really give this a biblical dealing. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to waste a lot of time in this sermon proving to you that abortion is murder. Because if you don't already know that, and I'll give you a couple of scriptures here up front, if you don't already know that, you're either a complete idiot, or else you're filled with Satan, or else you're evil, or, or, or all of the above. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time dealing with that. I just want to get into some other things about God's judgment upon this wicked sin. But first of all, many will try to say, and I'm, like I said, I'm only going to spend a couple minutes dealing with this because it's just a waste of my time and yours to, to spend the whole night proving to you that a baby that's living inside of its mother's womb is actually alive, okay? Because it, it defies all science, it defies all logic, it defies all common sense to say that it's not alive. That's why they have to kill it, because it's alive. Okay? Otherwise, there'd be nothing to kill. It wouldn't be multiplying and growing and, and thriving in the womb. But many will say, well, at what point does it become alive? Well, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 5. Here's a key verse to show you uh, the answer to that very foolish question. The Bible reads, As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child. Even so, thou knowest not the works of God, who maketh all. So the Bible says that God makes the child in the womb. You don't know how he does it. You don't know how the bones grow in the womb. You don't know the way of the Spirit. You have no idea. So don't pretend to know how a child develops in its mother's womb. That's none of your business. It doesn't matter. So to sit there and say, well, this point it's alive, or that point's alive, is nonsense. The Bible clearly teaches, I'll just give you a couple of scriptures. It says in Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. That same verse is quoted in Matthew 1, as, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Notice the difference. Conceive has been replaced with with child. What does that mean? That means when you conceive, you're with child. Yeah. Not with a blob of tissue, not with a blastocyst, not with fetus. No, when you conceive... You're with child. So then, people will try to attack what is the definition of conception. Well, the Bible's clear. Hebrews 11.11, 11, if you have a King James Bible, says, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. So, according to the Bible, conception involves the seed. The Bible calls it the seed of copulation. It is the seed that comes from the man. And the Bible says that that seed is what causes conception to take place in a woman. Well, guess what? The seed touches the egg and it's conceived. Some people will try to say, oh, conception is weeks later. No, the seed is gone weeks later. Mm -hmm. The seed is gone in a matter of days. And so therefore, at the very beginning stages, when a man and a woman come together and that seed uh, fertilizes that egg, that's what the Bible calls conception. And that's what the Bible calls a child. End of story, period, done. I mean, we've got John the Baptist who was leaping in his mother's womb just when Jesus Christ was brought near to him because Mary had Jesus in her womb and Elizabeth had John the Baptist in her womb. 
And as soon as John the Baptist was in proximity with the tiny little baby Jesus in the mother's womb, not just a blob, no, that was Jesus Christ. That was the Lord in that yeah. womb. Yeah. And that's why John the Baptist leaped in the womb, because of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in proximity, even while he was in the womb. So you have to be a complete atheist or a complete uh, Bible-rejecting type person to even say, it's not alive, it's not a child. There's so much Bible. I could spend the whole night proving to you that it's alive, but I'm not going to because it's a waste of my time. Therefore, ending that life is murder. Go to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter number 9. You see, the Bible's really clear about this, that killing an innocent person... Killing a, a, a man is murder. Now, the only time that God justifies killing would be in a defensive way. The Bible talks about you accidentally killing someone. That's manslaughter. The Bible talks about you killing someone in self-defense. The Bible talks about people who somebody breaks in in the middle of the night and they kill them because they're basically in danger of their own life. They're trying to just protect themselves and their family. The Bible talks about going to war. Of course, that would be a just war, a defensive type war, not just going out and, and uh, going to war for uh, money and, and desire to have, as James 4 says, from whence come wars and fightings among you, come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members, you kill and desire to have. Not when you're just out killing and, and invading countries in order to get material gain or more territory, but when you're fighting in a just cause to defend yourself or defend your life, liberty, or property, that's all fine and dandy. But when you kill an innocent person, which obviously a child in the womb is innocent, yep. nobody Amen. can say it's guilty of anything, mm -hmm. that's murder. Now, anything less than calling it murder, you're a compromiser. Right. Yep. And you're not uh, getting your, your beliefs from the Bible. You're getting your beliefs from society and, and Hollywood and, and TV and whatever else that's brainwashing you. But the Bible says very clearly in Genesis 9, 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood... By man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Now this is God's first institution of the death penalty in the Bible. Go to Numbers 35. God instituted the death penalty in the Bible upon murderers in Genesis 9, verse 6. This is right when Noah gets off the ark, is when it's first instituted. Well, much, much later, centuries later, it's reiterated in the Mosaic Law in Numbers 35, Verse 16, the Bible reads, And if he smite him with an instrument of iron, so that he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. You know what I find is funny? What does the doctor call his little tools and accoutrements? He calls them his surgical instruments. And the Bible says, oh, you use an instrument of iron to kill somebody? You're a murderer. He said, if it's an instrument of wood, you're a murderer. Look at verse 18, or if he smite him with a hand weapon of wood. Wherewith he may die, and he died. He's a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. Look at verse 30. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. Moreover, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer which is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. What does it mean to take no satisfaction? He says, you don't take any payment of money because sometimes, uh, for example, you'll commit a crime in the United States today and they'll say, this is the punishment. Either this much time in prison or you can pay a $20,000 fine. You know, six months in jail or $20,000. Who's ever seen uh, penalties that look like that? Well, he's saying, no, there is no satisfaction that you can take in the life of murder. There's nothing that they can pay or give to somehow cause them not to be put to death. He said, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. So the Bible's very clear here that when you kill somebody, he calls it murder, and he says, you shall surely be put to death. Period. That tells me that when the doctor uses his instrument of iron to kill an innocent baby, he should be put to death. Amen. Amen. That's what the Bible says. He's a murderer. Yep. He is a murderer. But not only that, but if you would, uh, consider David. Now, when David committed adultery with Bathsheba, you remember how he tried to cover it up? He sent Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, to the hottest part of the battle, and then withdrew the troops from him. And Nathan the prophet 
spoke for God on God's behalf and told David, he said, you have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the children of Ammon. So let me ask you this. Did David physically assault and kill Uriah? No. But did God call him a murderer? Yes, sir. And did God say you killed Uriah yes. with the sword of the children of Ammon? That means that anybody who uh, is indirectly involved is also a murderer. Anyone who gives the order to perform this wicked action and to kill this innocent life is also a murderer. For example, the children of Israel cried out, crucify him, when the Lord Jesus Christ was on trial with Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate was ready to let him go and turn him free. And the Jews said, no, crucify him many times throughout the book of Acts. Chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, again and again in the book of Acts, the Jews are told, you took Jesus with wicked hands and crucified him. Now, did the Jews literally, physically kill Jesus? No. It was a Roman soldier that nailed him to the cross. It was a Roman soldier that pierced his side. It was a Roman governor that issued the order. But God holds the Jews accountable all throughout the book of Acts, over and over again, saying, you are the ones who killed Jesus. Then, even decades later, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says again that the Jews killed the Lord Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. That means that anybody who is saying, kill it, abort it, they're guilty of murder. That's what the Bible is teaching. That the people who physically use the instrument of metal to kill it, and the ones who are consenting of it and telling them to do it, and that would mean the whole staff, the nursing staff, that would mean the mother's a murderer. Yep. Yep. I mean, if the mother walks in and says, would you kill my child for me? What difference is that from David right. saying to Joab, yep. make sure Uriah gets killed? Yep. Right. And yet David was guilty of murder for having Uriah killed. And so when the mother walks in and says, kill my child, that makes her a murderer. So it's not just the doctor that's a murderer. Oh, no. It's the woman who's having the abortion. She's a murderer, too. And the nurse is a murderer, too. And the politician who, who takes our tax dollars and actually sends that money to Planned Parenthood, like, you know, which plan, Planned Parenthood? Planned Parenthood is an organization that performs abortions all day long. And our federal government funds Planned Parenthood and you say, oh, they don't use that money for the abortions. Okay, let me give you an illustration on that. Who's got a bulletin in your hand? Everybody got a bulletin? Okay, look, look at the bulletin, okay? Look at the offering totals. Is everybody down there on the offering totals? Okay. Now, do you see how the missions giving is $54.53 for the very first part of January there? Does everybody see that? Yep. Okay, well, here's the thing. By the, we give unto our missionaries $300 per month because we give $100 a month to each of our three missionaries, okay? Well, guess what? Less than, less than $300 is going to come in in the month of January, okay? So that means that we're going to send out $300 for the missionaries, right? But actually, some of that money is going to come from the general fund to cover that. Now, other months, sometimes there will be an excess that comes in, and then it's carried over to the next month and so forth. But, but by and large, each year, less comes in the missions offering than what we give out, and we just cover that from the general fund. Now, this would be like if you came to church, right, and you wrote a check to Faith Forward Baptist Church, and you said, I want to make sure that this check does not go to missionaries. I don't want it to go to missionaries. I want it to go to what you're doing right here in Tempe. That's where I want my money to go. And I'm giving you $500, and I want to make sure it goes right here to what's going on in Tempe. And I said, okay, I'll make sure that your $500 only goes to what's going on right here in Tempe. Would that really be a meaningful distinction at all? Would it really mean anything? Because the same, we're going to do the same thing with the money. We're, we're still going to support the same missionaries. We're going to send them the exact same amount because the $500 that you gave will be money that we can put toward the building or put toward the salary or something else. And then that's just more money that we can send to the missionaries. So it's just moving numbers around on a page. It's meaningless. Do you see what I mean? 
It'd be like if you wrote a check and said, well, I want to make sure that my money only goes to buy songbooks. And here's 50 bucks. Well, you know what? That's just 50 bucks that we would have spent somewhere else. It's just, it, it's meaningless. Right. It's just moving numbers around. So this is what these politicians will get up and lie and say, oh, we don't fund abortion. While they send hundreds of millions of dollars to Planned Parenthood, let's face it, they're in the abortion business. That's the, that's the, the, the thing that they do, and they do tons of abortions every day. Uh, it's a fact. Nobody can dispute that. But they just say, oh, but these particular dollars. It'd be like if I handed you five $1 bills, and I just said, you know, use these two bills to buy a soda and use these three bills to buy a sandwich and make sure that you use the bills I told you to use. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You got five bucks. You're spending five bucks. It doesn't matter which bills. It, well, well, the, is that my five bucks that I put in the offering or is that another person's five bucks? Because I want to make sure my five bucks goes this. I'm taking the time to explain it because some people just don't get it. Yeah. They're liars. Yeah. They're taking your money that you work for and send out to them, and they're funding abortion with it. And they are murderers. If they're taking your money and voting and saying, I'm going to take this money, I'm going to send it to Planned Parenthood so that they can abort babies, they're murderers. So look, we have a lot of murderers involved here, biblically. Yeah. You got a bunch of abortion doctors, abortion nurses, a bunch of women uh, having abortions. It's all murder. Now, let me give you a few statistics. I'm going to get into a lot of Bible tonight. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Let me give you some statistics. Because what I want to preach about tonight is God's judgment upon abortion that is coming in this country. And it is coming. I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible that it's coming. But let me give you some statistics. Now... Just to make sure that there's no question about the accuracy of the statistics that I have tonight, I got these from a pro-abortion website. So, you know, I don't want somebody to say, oh yeah, you got some pro-life website that's skewing the statistics. No, I looked at a bunch of statistics and I chose to bring the one from a pro-abortion website, just the most conservative, so this is the most downplaying statistics you could possibly get. Because these are the ones trying to make it look like it's not so bad, and they're trying to promote abortion. So they're going to downplay it. The National Abortion Federation, a pro-abortion group, these are their statistics. And other pro-life groups have statistics that are even worse. So this is the mildest, most conservative statistics. Here's what they say. Each year, almost half of all pregnancies among American women are unintended. Whoops, is that where babies come from? <laughs> you got to be kidding. So anyway, half of pregnancies are unintended. Oh, man. And listen to this. Half of those unplanned pregnancies, 1.3 million each year are ended by abortion. Oh. That means 50% of the time when a woman becomes pregnant in America, and whoops, I didn't plan that, 50% of the time she's going to kill that baby. That's a pretty shocking statistic, I think. Now, 1.3 million each year, you know how much that translates out to? 3,561 a day. That's a lot. Yeah. Over 3,500 today, tomorrow, the next day, every day, 365 days a year. Listen to this. If current rates continue, it is estimated that 35% of all women of reproductive age in America today will have had an abortion by the time they reach age 45. Did you hear that? Wow. So by the time a woman gets to 45 in America, according to the current trends and the current statistics, and really it's been going on legally since 1973, so they've had a long time to look at the trend and look at the stats. They're saying that one thir over one-third of women, stop and think about that, in America today, one-third, one out of three women will have an abortion, will kill their own child. I mean, stop and think about it. Get, get, get this garbage, pro-choice. Don't even use that word in my presence. They will murder their own child. Listen to me now. You wonder why America's messed up. You wonder why our government's messed up. You wonder why the country's messed up. You wonder why our churches are messed up. I'm surprised it's not more messed up than it is. When one out of three women in America, even according to a pro-abortion website, you get other stats that'll say it's even a little more than that, one third, one out of three women are going to murder their own child by the time they're 45. What kind of a world do we live in? What kind of a cesspool?
ritual of filth and iniquity has our country become? And you say, God bless America? This is disgusting. This is abomination. Women murdering their own children. The Bible said in the last days that women would be without natural affection. Mm -hmm. We're here. That's right. yep. We're here. You say, well, it's not born yet. You know, a normal woman even loves her child even while it's in the womb. Yeah, haven't you seen women, they, they talk to their stomach, and they, mm -hmm. they, they pat their stomach, and they feel the kicking, and there's a bond that develops even before it's born. Now, let me break down some of these statistics to you, because these statistics are meant to downplay abortion. From a pro-abortion website, listen to this. Most abortions, 88%, are obtained in the first trimester of pregnancy. Now, that supposedly doesn't make it as bad if it's done in the first three months. Now listen, three months into it, the child is very developed. I mean, very. You, I mean, you can go on websites, look at photos and, and videos of a child that's three months into it. But here's what's so ridiculous about this. So they say, well, 88% is in the first three months. You know what I look at that? I just look at that as 12% are past three months. Yeah. Now, somebody have a, you got a calculator? Does that calculator work? Fire that thing up. Okay. <laughs> listen to this. It doesn't sound like a lot. And then it says, well, fewer than 2% occur at 21 weeks or later. That's, that's more than halfway through the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very late term. Well, it's fewer than 2%. Okay, but wait a minute, you forgot. There's 3,561 a day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so give me 3,561 times 0 0.02. So there's 70 every day that are more than halfway through their pregnancy being aborted. Okay, give me, give me 1.3, okay, 1.3 times 0 0.02. 0 0.026. 0 0.026 million a year, okay? So what's 0 0.026 million? That's what, 26,000 and some odd every year that are killed. Listen, 26,000 that are killed more than halfway through the pregnancy when it's a very developed baby. Very much developed. I mean, you know, how can anyone dispute its life? Even that alone, forget the 98% that are in the first half. That's 26,000 in the second half every year. And then, you know, 9-11 happens. And it's what, about 3,000? That's a big deal. People, people really care about that. Man, when the, when the anniversary of 9-11 rolls around, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't mourn the loss of 3,000 human beings. That is a big loss of life. But man, they'll put the banner up and every church will have a big thing and, and a big memorial service. And, and they say, you know, never forget, lest we forget, we will not forget. Well, have you forgotten what happened yesterday? Yeah, right. 3,500? Have you forgotten the one that's about to happen tomorrow? We're never going to let that happen again. In fact, we're going to grope and molest you at the airport and take away your freedoms and wiretap you, and we're going to go to war in Iraq, and we're going to go to war in Afghanistan because we never want to lose another 3,000 people as 3,000 are being killed every day. Yeah. Wow. Legalized murder. You say, well, I'm a libertarian. I'm pro-choice. You're not a libertarian, you devil. A real libertarian believes in life, liberty, and property for Amen. all. Amen. If you're a libertarian, why don't you believe in the right to life? Why don't you believe in people's freedom to be alive? You phony. You devil. It says in the Declaration of Independence that we're endowed by our Creator with inalienable rights, and of these are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. That's the first right that government is even there to, to, to protect, is our right to life, our right to be alive. Amen. And if that came from God, God is the one who gives life. God is the one who creates the child in its mother's womb. And, and you do not have the right to murder someone else and call that freedom. Well, this is freedom. Just blow people away. That's garbage. That's not what libertarianism is supposed to stand for. Uh, as somebody who really believes in liberty, believes in liberty for the weak as well. The elderly, the unborn, it believes in everybody's right to be alive. Amen. Including babies, including the unborn. And so, you know, when you break down the statistics that way, you see there's a lot of cold-blooded murder 
taking place, even if you just take the late term abortion. But I say that the early term abortion is just as wicked. Amen. Because God doesn't differentiate whether you kill it when it's this old or kill it when it's that old. But just the most brazen, disgusting type of abortions are taking place thousands and thousands a year, even with these kind of statistics. And uh, the statistics go on and on. 13% of those who have an abortion describe themselves as a born-again or evangelical Christian. Did you hear that? 13%. 27% say they're a Catholic. So 27% say they're Catholic when they're getting abortion. 13 say they're an evangelical or born-again Christian. So 40%, just those two denominational type of groups there, 40% are claiming the name of Christ. Are you listening to me? 40% as they get... An, an abortion are claiming to believe in Jesus Christ. Is this unbelievable? They, they must not have gone to a church that preached like this. And everybody says that the Catholic Church is, is so uh, hardcore against abortion. Well, then why are, why are their members getting so many abortions? When only 22% of American women are Catholic, 27% of those getting an abortion are Catholic. So an inordinate number of Catholics are getting the abortions. Boy, they're really teaching their people, aren't they? They're really preaching to them hard. They, I bet this sermon's going on at Catholic churches all over America. This exact <laughs> sermon tonight. Funny, I doubt that. But there are a lot more statistics here listed. I'm going to get back to a little bit of this. But that gives you a little bit of an idea of the abortions and, and how many... that One out of three women are guilty of this in America. And you wonder why we live in a messed up country? Well, that should tell you why. You wonder why, guys, you know, you're out trying to, to meet uh, a young lady to spend the rest of your life with, and you want to you uh, get married uh, to a, a nice, godly young lady. Well, you know, one-fifth of abortions take place with women that are 19 or under. You know, a lot of these women that you're, that you're talking to, you know, that's why you, be careful with these unsaved girls. A lot of them have already murdered their own child, and they're only 19 or 20. I mean, it's unbelievable today, but this is the world that we live in. Go to Deuteronomy 21. Let's see what God feels about human life. Let's look at God's respect for human life, and let's look at the judgment upon murder in the Bible, and the judgment upon those who do not respect human life. The Bible reads in Deuteronomy 21.1, If one be found slain in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who hath slain him. So God's giving a law here for somebody who is just found dead laying in a field. Nobody knows who killed him, Nobody knows how it happened. They're just out in the field and they find a dead body. It says in verse 2, Then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about him that is slain. And it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of that city shall take an heifer which hath not been wrought with, and which hath not drawn in the yoke. And the elders of that city shall bring down the heifer unto a rough valley, which is neither eared nor sown and shall strike off the heifer's head, neck there in the valley. And the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near. For them the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him, and to bless in the name of the Lord. And by their word shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. And all the elders of that city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. And they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. Be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed, and lay not innocent blood unto thy people of Israel's charge, and the blood shall be forgiven them. So shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you, when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Now let me break this down to you. They find a, a, a body. They don't know how it happened. They don't know who's guilty. In fact, it's out in a field. It wasn't even in a city. They're not even sure which city the murderer lives in. So they measure to the closest cities. And let's say the closest city is, you know, five miles away. Well, they bring the elders of that city, all the people who rule in that city, the Levites, the judges, they come out to that body, and they go out to the field, and they take a heifer, okay? And a heifer is, of course, a cow. And they take this heifer, and it's a heifer that has never been wrought with, it's not drawn to the oak, so it's, it's, a, it's an animal of value. Because it's a cow that hasn't been used yet. So this is, this is an expensive item. And they bring that cow, and they behead that cow as a picture, as a symbol. And they say this, they say, Lord, you know, we don't know 
who killed this guy. We're swearing an oath right now. We're all the elders here. We're all the judges here. We're all promising and telling you, God, that we do not know who did this. And we are beheading this heifer just as a symbol of, of punishing, you know, that we would punish whoever had done this, but we don't know who did it. So we're offering this heifer up as a sacrifice to you. We're, we're, we're beheading it, and we are swearing that we do not know who did this. And we're at, and then look what they ask God to do. Be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast believed, and lay not innocent blood unto thy people of Israel's charge, and the blood shall be forgiven. So basically, they don't want to be cursed by having an unpunished murder. They know that God punishes murder. And they don't want the curse to be on the whole town. They don't want the whole nation of Israel to be cursed. So they want to punish the murderer. But they can't punish the murderer because they don't know who did the murder. So instead, they just behead this animal and swear to God, we don't know who did it, and so please be merciful. And the Bible says, if they go through that process, God will forgive the, the innocent blood. He will not curse the land. He will not curse them. He will not bring that guilt upon them. Now, stop and think for a moment. What if they don't do this? What if they just say, we don't care? This doesn't matter. Who cares? Oh, we found a dead body, so what? Oh, he's been stabbed to death, well, whatever. Well, God says that if they go through this process, then the blood will be forgiven them. What if they don't go through this process? It's not going to be forgiven. Okay? So what about this? What if they know who did it? And they just don't punish. Is it going to be forgiven the land? Is it going to be forgiven the city? No. It's not going to be forgiven. It's going to be charged under them. So when murder takes place, and it's not dealt with, it's not punished, and people just let it go, well then that's going to bring a curse upon the land and a curse upon the nation. I'm going to prove that to you with many more scriptures tonight. And I'm going to show you the curse that we're under tonight as a nation. Because of the innocent blood that's being shed, it's not being dealt with. Go, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter 16. You see, this is not a new thing. People killing their own children. It happens all throughout the Bible. It happened in America before 1973, Roe vs. Wade. It happened throughout our nation's history. It happened throughout the history of the children of Israel. It's happened throughout world history. There's nothing new under the sun. And the Bible deals with this subject in great detail. And some of the things I'm going to read for you, I'm not going to say anything that's graphic or anything like that, but some of the things I read to you from the Bible might be a little bit graphic, but you know what? That's God's Word. Amen. It's not me talking. This is the Bible talking. Listen to what the Bible says about this. First of all, I want to show you that this is something that the children of Israel had been involved in is killing their own children. Okay? Go to 2 Kings verse 16, or chapter 16, verse 3. It says, But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. Go to chapter 17, verse 31. And the Abites made Nibhaz and Tartak, and the Sephorbites burnt their children in fire to Adramalek and Anamalek, the gods of Sepharvaim. Go to 2 Kings 23, verse 10. 2 Kings 23, verse 10. And he defiled Tophet, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. So that's what people were doing there. They were passing their children through the fire. He says in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 3, 2 Chronicles 28.3, Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and burnt his children in the fire, after the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So this is something that the heathen had been doing, killing their, their children, burning them in the fire. And then this is something that the children of Israel learned from the heathen, and they started doing it too. Look at chapter 33, verse 6. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom, also he observed times, and used enchantments, and used witchcraft, and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. 
So over and over again, you see these kings and also the children of Israel and also the heathen nations around them killing their own children. Go to Psalm 105. Psalm 105. Psalm 105. I'm sorry, Psalm 106. Psalm 106. The Bible says in verse 35 of Psalm 106, But they were mingled among the heathen and learned their works, and they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. Look at verse 38. And shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works and went a-whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance, and he gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. So the Bible is clear here. They were shedding the blood of their own children. Were they not? Yep. Yep. They were passing them through the fire. They were also killing them in a way that caused bloodshed. Go to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter number 16. Ezekiel 16 verse 20. Ezekiel 16 20, the Bible reads, Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me. And remember, this is God speaking. And these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? that thou hast slain my children. So God's calling these children my children. <laughs> right. He's saying, you're killing my children. And delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them. Verse 22. And in all thine abominations and thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth when thou wast naked and bare and was polluted in thy blood. He's saying, you were a baby too at one point. And it came to pass after all thy wickedness, and look what he just puts in parentheses here. Woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord God. You say, oh, don't you feel bad for these babies that are being killed? You know what? The Bible's really clear in about, I can show you four places, I don't have time tonight. I can show you four clear places in the Bible that teach that a baby who dies in its mother's womb or as a newborn or as a young baby, they all go to heaven. The Bible's really clear on that. They've not yet even had the chance to, to sin or to know right from wrong or hear the gospel. The Bible's clear that they're all going to heaven. i got four scriptures I can prove that with. I'll, I'll, I've done it in many other sermons. I don't have time tonight. It's really woe unto the people who are killing their children. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know, it's not really, you know, less than, you know, do I feel bad for a child in its womb that's being burned <coughs> to death with a salt solution? Or being killed in some other horrific way? And look, there's just no clean way to do it. No. You're killing a human being. Amen. There's no there's no nice way to do it. There's no way. Oh, it's just painless. Well, you know what? Have you tried it? No. Nobody has. And so, who really is the one that ought to be pitied? It reminds me of this. Remember when Jesus was carrying the cross up to Golgotha? And they were crying. Women were looking on and they're crying. It's so sad that he's being beaten and he's, he was such a great preacher and he's such a godly man. And here he is. He's whipped and bloody and beat. He's carrying the cross up the hill. And Jesus said, don't weep for me. He said, weep for your children. Let's turn there quickly. Keep your finger in Ezekiel 16. We have to come back there. But let me just show you this quickly in, in, in uh, Luke chapter... Luke chapter number, uh, what is it, Luke 23, right? Luke 23, let me find my place here. I don't have the red letter edition. Somebody help me find it. It's, it's, it's going to be in the red letters in uh, chapter 20. Here we go, I found it. Look at verse 27 of Luke 23. And there followed him a great company. They followed Jesus while he's carrying the cross. And actually, he, he actually had to pass off the cross to Simon of Cyrene in the... In the in the, in the previous verse. It says in verse 27, There followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. They feel bad for him. They're crying about him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of, of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and weep for your children. Oh, don't weep for the abortion, uh, the aborted child. He's saying, weep for yourself if you participated in it. 
Weep for yourself if you're the murderer in any of the ways that we described earlier. Weep for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the womb that never bare and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. Go back to Ezekiel 16. I wanted to get you the picture there. In Ezekiel chapter 16, let's pick up where we left off. Woe unto thee, verse 24, that thou hast also built unto thee an eminent place, and hast made thee in high place in every street. Thou hast built thy high place at every head of the way, and hast made thy beauty to be abhorred, and has opened thy feet to everyone that passed by and multiplied thy whoredoms. Now, over and over in this chapter where he talked about killing their own children, you know what the one word that just keeps coming up over and over again when he talks about the people who killed their own children? Whoredom. 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 I mean, look how many times. Just look, just glance down at the page and just see it in verse 34. It's in verse 33. Adultery, verse 32. Harlot in verse 31. Whorish, verse 30. Fornication, verse 29. Whore, verse 28. Lewd, verse 27. Whoredoms, fornication, verse 26. Verse 25, whore. He said, you're a whore. 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 Yep. And I said, every pro-choice woman, so-called, every one of these one in three that's had an abortion, you're a whore. Because the Bible says that you're not a little loose. No. It doesn't say, oh, she's a little bit risque. No, she's a filthy whore. Yeah, That's man. what the Bible says. Amen. You say you're going to hurt somebody's feelings. Good. Well, I hope they don't read Ezekiel 16. It might hurt their feelings. No, the Bible says they're a whore. And he said, you know what? You've caused your beauty to be abhorred. Abhorred means hated. You may look beautiful on the outside, but God said, your beauty is disgusting because of what you are on the inside, because you murder your own child. He said, you are disgusting. Listen to this. Did you know that 83% of women getting abortions are not married? They're a bunch of whores. 83% of them aren't married. They're whores. They're out sleeping around. Oh, I didn't plan this. Well, did you plan to open your feet unto everyone that passed by? <laughs> That's what the Bible said you did, you little whore, you. And it's disgusting, it's filthy, and there's no excuse for it. I'm not going to use these little modern words that the Bible tries to sugar, I mean that the society tries to sugarcoat it. Do you see anything sugarcoated in this chapter we're reading? No. Nope. Nope. It looks like he's mad. I mean, to say all those things, you've got to be pretty mad. Let's keep reading it. I have it printed out on my notes here. He said, you opened your feet to everyone that passed by and multiplied thy whoredoms. Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians thy neighbors, great of flesh, and hast increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. Behold, I have stretched out my hand over thee and have diminished thine ordinary food and delivered thee under the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd way. Thou hast played the whore. A little down further. Thou hast played the harlot. You've multiplied fornication, verse 29. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Anderson. You're wrong, Pastor Anderson. These women are not whores. Because, Pastor Anderson, a whore is someone who sells their body. Isn't that what a whore is? Who thinks that's what a whore is, right? Isn't that what it is, a prostitute? Isn't that somebody who sells their body? Yeah. So you say, well, these women aren't selling it, Pastor Anderson. It's consensual. It's not, there's no money changing hands. Oh, God's got a word for you. Go down a little bit. It says in verse 33, you say, well, no, whores are getting paid. God, God said in verse 33, they give gifts to all whores. So he said, yeah, whores do get paid. Right? They give them money, they give them things to pay for it. Remember, there was a harlot in Genesis. And, uh, uh, what's his name? Judah. 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 He comes to the, to the, the, the harlot and he basically, you know, she's like, what are you going to give me? Tamar. And he, you know, he's basically, yeah, she, it was Tamar dressed up as her. And he's going to give her a sheep of the flock, or a kid of the goats, or whatever. See, they give gifts to all whores. But look what the Bible says. But thou givest thy gifts to all thy lovers. He said, usually the whore is receiving money. You're giving them money, he says. And hirest them, that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. And the contrary, contrary is what? Like the opposite? 
The contrary is in thee from other women in thy whoredoms, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms, in that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee, therefore thou art contrary. He's saying, you're worse than a whore, because you're not even getting paid. And you're just sleeping around. And you're just opening your feet to everybody that passes by. He's saying, you're worse than a whore. At least a whore is getting paid. You're doing the paying. You're so disgusting that you're the one who's paying. This is what our country has become. This is America. Wherefore, O harlot, verse 35, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers and with all the idols of thy abominations and by the blood of thy children which thou didst give unto them, Behold, therefore, I will gather all thy lovers whom thou hast taken pleasure, and all them that thou hast loved, with all them that thou hast hated, I will even gather them round about against thee, and will discover thy nakedness unto them, that they may see all thy nakedness, and I will judge thee as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged. I will give thee blood in fury and jealousy. He's saying, I'm going to bring blood upon you like a river. You want to shed blood? Your blood's going to be shed. He said, I will also give thee into their hand, verse 39, and they shall throw down thine eminent place, and shall break down thy high places. They shall strip thee also of thy clothes, and shall take thy fair jewels, and leave thee naked and bare. They shall also bring up a company against thee, and they shall stone thee with stones, and thrust thee through with their swords, and shall burn thy houses with fire, and execute judgments upon thee in the sight of many women, and I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot, and thou also shalt give no hire any more. That's a pretty serious judgment. Mm -hmm. He said, you're going to be stripped, you're going to be killed, you're going to have your, 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 your blood shed, your children are going to be killed, you're going to be uh, abused, your, your nakedness is going to be uncovered against your will, you're going to be totally judged in all these ways. And then you'll stop being a harlot. And look what verse 42 says. So will I make my fury to, to, toward thee to rest, and my jealousy shall depart from thee, and I will be quiet and will be no more angry. So when's God going to stop being angry? After he's done all that. After he's executed all that punishment, he says, okay, then I'll stop being angry. So let me ask you something. Go to 2 Kings chapter 22. I've got to move forward in my sermon. There's so much scripture. I have pages and pages of scripture. I mean, look, take my word for it. I hope you're reading your Bible cover to cover this year. I'll tell you right now, there is so much scripture in my sermon notes right now, and it all reads exactly like what I just read to you. Just pages and pages of it. And I didn't even scratch the surface of what's in the Bible. And so I want you to go to 2 Kings chapter 22 because I want you to see that God's judgment is coming upon our nation because of abortion. And listen to me now, listen to me, there's no way to stop it. It cannot be. You say, no, we're going to turn it around. We're going to stop. No, listen to me. It cannot be stopped. It's coming. It can't stop. It will happen. There's no way to fix it. It cannot be stopped. You say, well, that's a hopeless message. Well, not for me. I'm going to heaven. I didn't kill my own children. But our nation is doomed. And I'm just telling you the truth tonight. You can't fix it. You can't stop it. Well, you know, maybe we can get a, 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 a pro-life president. And maybe we can get some people in the Supreme Court. We can overturn Roe or something is already done. You've already killed millions of innocent people. You can't just say, I I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that, or we're going to do it right from here on out. We're not going to do it anymore. Sorry, there's still a punishment coming upon this nation. 2 Kings chapter 22. Now let me explain this to you. There was a king named Manasseh. And this King Manasseh, we read about him earlier when we were reading about all the people who killed their children. He was one of them. Manasseh was a wicked king who killed his own child. Well, Manasseh, he also shed a lot of innocent blood in Jerusalem. Now, he was a very wicked man. He performed a lot of witchcraft. Now, at the very end of his life, he got saved. <clears throat> okay? Now, here's the thing. He had a son... And his son was wicked, you know, poor Amon. And then his son was Josiah. Now, Josiah was a godly, righteous man. Now, keep in mind, Manasseh and all the children of Israel had shed all this innocent blood and committed all this filth and abomination. So God's judgment is going to come upon them. But it hasn't come yet. So this man Josiah comes along. 
Manasseh's grandson. And Josiah becomes king, and he's a good man. He's a righteous man. He's a godly man. And so he does that which is right in the sight of the Lord. He gets rid of all the abominations. He gets rid of the abortion and murder. He gets rid of all the false gods and everything. And he's a righteous leader. Well, he goes to seek after the Lord. Because he finds the book of the law. He sees how they've broken a lot of laws. They know God's wrath is coming. They know judgment is coming. And so they want to seek the Lord and see what's going to happen to us. So they're looking for a preacher. They can't even find a prophet. They finally find a woman prophet. She's, she's going to be their prophet because that's all they can find. So they go to hold of the prophetess. Look what she says to them in verse 15 of 2 Kings 22. And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof. Even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read. Talking about the Bible. Because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the words of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. So is God going to let it go because many, many years have gone by? He says, no, nope, my wrath is coming. My judgment is coming. It's coming upon the land. It's coming upon the inhabitants of the land. It's coming like a freight train. Nothing can stop it. But look what, he said, look what she says next. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall ye say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spake against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and has rent thy clothes, and wept before me. I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee, singular, unto thy fathers, and thou, singular, shall be gathered into thy grave in peace, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. Go to chapter 24. Listen to me now. When the prophetess spoke unto Josiah, did she say... Well, you know what, since you, since you got rid of all the abortion, you got rid of all the witchcraft, you got rid of all the Satan worship, now God's not going to punish the land anymore. Is that what she said? No. She said, no, it's coming. His wrath is coming, his judgment's coming, the punishment's coming, but because you've done right, basically, you will not be punished. And in fact, it's not even going to come while you're the king. While you're reigning... You're not even going to see it happen. It's going to be after you die. Because you have done... And I mean, Josiah, listen to me now. Josiah did a lot of really good stuff. I did a whole sermon on the life of Josiah. I mean, he did He did the best he could. I mean, he did a lot. He did great things for God. He was probably the greatest king of, of Judah of all time. I mean, he was a great, great king. I don't see how anybody could have done better than Josiah. You know... I mean, as far as cleaning the land out. He did the best possible job. Was that enough to stop the judgment from coming out? It wasn't enough. Because you, you, you got to understand how God works. His thoughts are not our thoughts, and His ways are not our ways. In God's mind, there's this thing called justice that maybe we don't have the same way He has it. He has a very extreme sense of justice. So extreme that in order to forgive the sins of mankind, the only way He could do it was to die for us. And to take our punishment for us. Because he can't just let things go. He can't. He punishes sin. And so when it comes to our salvation, Jesus had to die for us to be saved. To satisfy God's justice, justice and judgment. Look at verse 24. After Josiah dies, everything's fine while Josiah's alive. After Josiah dies, Josiah's son becomes king. And the wrath and judgment comes. Look at 2 Kings 24, 3. Surely at the commandment of the Lord, this is talking about the fact that they're invaded by the Babylonians, they're slaughtered by the Babylonians. I'm going to show you some scriptures on that in a moment. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh. What? Are you talking about the great grandfather of the king that's on the throne right now? I mean, are you talking about Manasseh, who is a long time... Why? You didn't let that go? No. God won't let it go. 
He said, for the sins of Manasseh, according to all he did. Why? Why did God not let it go? And also for the innocent blood that he shed. You see that? For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. So God said, look, even decades later, I don't pardon innocent blood. If somebody commits murder, you better put the murderer to death. Or you, and if you can't figure out who did it, you better pray to God and tell him you're sorry and that you did the best you could. And that you tried to find him and you couldn't find him. If you know who did it and the governing authorities, if the, if the, the revenger of blood, the revenger of wrath uh, does not put them to death, you know, you're going to be cursed by God. And I'll tell you what, I find it hard to believe that Manasseh could have filled that land with any more innocent blood that has flowed in the United States of America from these so-called abortion clinics. <laughs> You say, well, you know, the, the one, the early term, you know, didn't even have blood in his body yet. It's just a little, you know, tranny little baby. But you know what? What about all the ones that did have blood in their body? Mm -hmm. Even that makes up thousands and thousands and thousands, yay, millions. Is that blood going to be pardoned? Is God going to let it go? Is he going to just say, oh, bless your heart. You know, you voted pro-life. <laughs> we'll let it go now. Go to Revelation 13. And I'm going to tell you something. Truer words were never spoken than what you're going to read in Revelation 13, 10. This is a law. This is axiomatic. This is, you know, have you ever heard the saying, what goes up must come down? This is one of those kind of statements that's axiomatic. In fact, it's more axiomatic. It says in Revelation 13, hint 10, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. It's that simple, my friend. You say, well, what's going to happen? What's the judgment going to be? Well, I'll tell you right now. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And what a nation soweth, that nation shall reap. They will reap exactly what they've sown. See, when you sow wheat, you don't gather barley. You gather wheat. When you sow rye, you gather rye. How were the children of Israel punished for all the innocent blood that they shed when they sacrificed their own sons and daughters and shed the blood of their own sons and daughters? Well, it's a little bit graphic, but it's what the Bible says. Go to 2 Kings chapter 8. I'm going to show you in several places. 2 Kings chapter 8. I didn't write the Bible. How did, they, how did God punish it? How were they punished for doing such an awful thing? Well, truly what goes around comes around. And I'll tell you right now, this is the, this is the same thing. Well, I'll show you in a minute. But look at, look at 2 Kings 8.12. And Hazael said, Why weepeth my Lord? Now, who's, who's he talking to? This is Hazael, who's going to become the king of Syria. And he's speaking unto Elijah, okay? And Elijah is, is, is weeping. And Hazael said, why are you crying? Why are you weeping, my Lord? And he answered, because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire. And their young women wilt thou, or thou young men wilt thou slay with the sword. And wilt dash their children and rip up their women with child. Now look at that. You know what the children of Israel have been doing? God sent Elijah to anoint Hazael, the Syrian, with oil to be the king of Syria because God was going to use him. And you remember the passage this morning that we turned to where he said, I've reserved to myself 7,000 men that are not about to need the image of Baal. At the same time, he told Elijah, he said, go anoint Elisha to be a prophet in your say. And he said, let's, let's just go there. I don't want to leave anything, any stone unturned here. Let's go to that passage. What is that? 1 Kings 19. Let me, let me find that passage here. <clears throat> Somebody help me find it. It's the, it's the one where he's in the cave and he hears the still small voice and he's told about the 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. I believe it's chapter 19. Verse 18 is about the 7,000. Thank you, thank you. You found it for me. Okay. 
So, the Bible says in verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Mahola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass, that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. So these are people who God is using for judgment. To basically slay the wicked. That's who, that's who these men are. And, uh, you know, Hazael is one of them. A foreign king. A foreign power. Syria was the enemy of Israel, of course. And, you know, I, you know Elijah anointed him. Okay, Elisha later on, you know, reinforced that. A lot of times you see kings that are anointed repeatedly and so forth. The bottom line is this. <coughs> The children of Israel had participated in those type of sins. And what was their punishment? The Bible says that their women with child were ripped up. Now that's a pretty gruesome sight. That's a pretty horrible thought. That, that, that sends chills to even think about how horrific that is. But that's what God... Now God's not the one who did it. God allowed a foreign enemy to come in and do that to them. That they might reap what they had sown. Oh, okay, you're going to kill your own children? Well, your children are going to be dashed against the stones. The ones that you actually decided that you wanted to have. The one that was planned. The planned parenthood in your life. Not the unplanned that you killed. Well, guess what? God's saying, I'm going to kill the one you planned. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you're going to be ripped up while you're pregnant. That's a pretty gruesome thought. Look at 2 Kings 15, 16. And th no, this isn't just mentioned once. Oh, it's mentioned over and over again. You say, I've never heard about this stuff. Well, hey, you know, this is really a great book. You should pick it up and read it sometime. <laughs> you know, maybe you could take it off the coffee table and actually read it. And get past Genesis chapter 10 this year. In your yearly Bible reading, and you'll actually learn this stuff. You say, Pastor Harrison, you preach stuff I've never heard. You know, well, read the Bible and you'll hear this stuff. He says in 2 Kings 15, 16, Then man, Manam smote Tifsa and all that were therein and the coast thereof from Tirzah because they opened not to him. Therefore he smote it and all the women therein that were with child he ripped up. This is the judgment of God coming upon them. Go to Hosea chapter 13. Hosea 13. While you're turning there I'll read for you Amos 1 13. Thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of the children of Ammon and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they have ripped up the women with child of Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. So here, God is punishing the children of Ammon, because they ripped up the women with child of Israel. Why? Because the children of Israel were being punished for what they did, which was killing their own children. And this is the punishment that they got. Hosea 13, 16. Samaria shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child shall be ripped up. Now that's horrible. Go to Isaiah chapter 13. Isn't that terrible? Yep. Amen. That's horrible. But let me tell you what I believe today. I believe that the, that, the, that the pregnant mothers of America one day will have their, will have their stomachs ripped up, as the Bible says. Amen. And I'm talking about the wicked. I'm talking about the ungodly, and I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible that it's coming. This is a punishment that's horrific. But you know what? It's horrific when women kill their own children, too. And see, you don't think it's that bad. You just call it pro-choice, and you just call it a woman's right to choose, and you say it's not a big deal. It doesn't matter what you say or what you think or what I say or what I think or what the, the National Abortion Federation... Here's what it says at the top of their website on the homepage. Abortion is an integral part of reproductive health care. Abortion is an integral part of reproductive health care. So we hear people talk about health care. This is part of, part of this is what they're talking about. A, pretty much a big part of it. If it's taking place 3,500 times a day, everybody talking about health care, health care, health care, health care. Well, this is part of what they're talking about. Because abortion is an integral part of, of reproductive health care. But you know what? It doesn't matter what the National Abortion Federation says. Because they're going to be ripped up. And their children that they planned are going to be dashed in pieces. I believe that. 
Amen. And I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible. Because you see, Isaiah 13 is an interesting chapter. Because Isaiah 13 is prophetic about events that have not even taken place yet. Because Isaiah 13 is about the day of the Lord. Now it talks about some things that took place at that time about Babylon. But it also carries forward into the future. Because remember the Bible talks about the day of the Lord that's coming. When the sun and the moon are darkened. And when the sun and the moon are darkened, the Bible says that God is going to pour out His wrath on this earth. This is after the rapture. So we as believers are not going to be here for this part. We're going to go through the tribulation, the Antichrist, and so forth. But at the end of the tribulation, the sun and moon are darkened. That's when Jesus comes in the clouds and we're raptured. Well, then He begins to pour out His wrath, the seven trumpets, the seven vials of God's wrath. That is poured out in the day of the Lord. The Bible calls it the day of the Lord when the sun and moon are darkened. Now, in those judgments, yes, God is turning the water into blood. Yes, God's raining fire and brimstone. But if you remember my sermon that I preached on Wednesday night, one of those judgments is that there's going to be, this is one of the judgments, there's going to be an army of horsemen that come through, a military force that's going to come through, and this is found in Revelation chapter number 9, when the sixth trumpet is sounded, 200 million soldiers will come through, and they will slay, uh, what is it, a third of the, of the, of the men, upon the, of, the, of, the, of the people on the earth? And let me tell you something. Part of what they're going to be doing is they're going to be carrying out this judgment that I'm going to read to you right now in Isaiah 13. It says in Isaiah 13, in verse 15, uh, Isaiah 13, verse 15, everyone that is found, and if you, you know, I don't have time to read the whole chapter to you. But if you read the entire chapter, the Bible's real clear. This is talking about the day of the Lord. It talks about the sun and moon being dark. It talks about all that. It says in verse 15, Everyone that is found shall be thrust through, and everyone that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled, and their wives ravished. That's exactly the judgments that he talked about would come upon the children of Israel. Their wives will be ravished. You want, to open, you want to commit adultery? You want to open your feet to strangers that are not your husband? You want to be a whore and a harlot and a fornicator? He says, okay, you remember he said they'd be stripped naked and they would be ravished and they would be abused by a group of men. Didn't the Bible say that? Yeah. And he said that their children would be dashed in pieces and that the pregnant women would be ripped up. That's what the Bible says is going to happen in the day of the Lord. This is coming upon an unsaved world. Thank God, uh, you know, it's not going to come upon us as God's people. But it's coming. I've got a whole passage in Nahum. I'm going to skip it for sake of time. But in Nahum, oh, look at, look at verse 18. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. And God's saying, you know, you didn't have any pity on the fruit of your womb. Why should I? You're going to kill your own children? Well, I'll kill the rest of them. He says, no, they won't have any pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare the children. It's not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you say, well, that already happened. Yeah, but guess what? God calls it Babylon in Revelation 18 as what's still going to happen during the day of the Lord. And so, no, this is talking about the future. It's still coming. Now let's turn to one last place, Psalm 59. I'm sorry, Psalm 58. Last place I want to turn. You say, what do we do about it, Pastor Anderson? You know what? There's nothing we can do except just be righteous and preach righteousness. And hey, thank God this world's not our home. We're just passing through. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You know, I mean, what, what can we do except don't commit murder? Yeah. Don't be a whore. Don't fornicate. Don't sleep with... And, and by the way, young men, you say, well, I'm a man. This doesn't apply to you. You know what? Don't you go and sleep around because then you might you might impregnate some girl that aborts your child. Yeah. And you don't think God's going to hold you accountable for that when you father an illegitimate child and then, it's, and then it's aborted? Because half of unplanned pregnancies are. So if you impregnate some girl out in the world, 50-50 chance she's going to abort it. And there's nothing you can do to stop it legally. You have no rights as a man. If you try to say, hey, that's my child, don't abort it, they'll say, no, you don't have that right. So, young man, what do you get from the sermon? Don't fornicate. 
God's wrath will be poured out upon you. Do not uh, commit fornication. Do not commit adultery. Do not be a whore. A uh, young lady, keep yourself pure and virgin until your wedding day. And if you do commit the sin of fornication, you better not have the sin of murder on top of it. He said, well, you don't understand their situation. Hey, two wrongs don't make a right. And they love to bring up a rare case about a rape or incest. Totally a rare case, but you know what? Even if it is rape or incest, two wrongs don't make a right. Yeah. You can't murder someone. Well, you don't understand. There's rape or incest. It doesn't matter. You don't murder a life. You can't murder the child. The child is not the one guilty of that. Right. You don't murder that child. It's wrong under all circumstances. There are no exceptions. Period. What about no? Oh, but you don't. No! There are no exceptions. Psalm 58. Go to Psalm 137 also. You can put your finger there. Let me give you some other statistics. I'm about to close up the sermon here. but Now, here's a statistic from the same National Abortion Federation website. Who runs? What kind of a filthy whore runs this website? <laughs> but I'd like to. Yeah. Amen. But anyway, they have this site. And this is, the, this is the Crimea River page about all the violence that's been done unto abortion clinics and abortion doctors. This is all the statistics of violence against those who do the abortions. Now, remember what we talked about how, you know, God's only going to be satisfied once, you know, the wicked are punished. Well, the wicked aren't being punished because abortion's 100% legal in America. It's totally legal. So there's no punishment. So we're just adding up God's wrath. You say, well, but I think, Pastor Anderson, I think there were some people who got mad and, and killed the horse doctor. Okay, listen to this. Did you know that in the last, okay, uh, what is this, 30, how long has it been since Roe vs. Wade? I guess this could be the anniversary. Uh, what's that? 40, 50, what would it be, 39? Is that right? 39 years, okay. Or what, or what was it, 73? Yeah, 39 years. Well, from 1977, so I guess that'd be like 35 years ago. From 1977 until 2010, do you know how many abortion uh, doctors were murdered? Or, or, or anyone involved, you know, whether it was the doctor, the nurse. One, one, time there, one time there was a security guard. And they're like, oh, the poor security guard. It's like, what are you doing? We're yeah, in security in a abortion clinic. And you, you're, you're mad because you got killed. You know, what are you doing in the in the in the butcher in this human butcher mill? Okay, but listen, you know how many have been hurt? Eight. That's it? Yeah. So they killed so <laughs> wait a minute. So so here's the tally. They've murdered what? 1.3 million a year or whatever, you know, 40 some odd million. How many of them have been murdered? Eight. Oh no, that's so <laughs> terrible. We need to, you know, we need to stop preaching so hard. We're inciting all this violence. <laughs> Uh, it's people like Pastor Anderson who, who, who cause all this violence toward abortion doctors. Oh, oh wow. Eight. <laughs> and seven of them were before I even started preaching. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. It's like, don't blame me. One of them was in 2009, and before that, none since 1998. I was 17. Don't blame me for this. You know, so one. Or one died in the last 10 years. Eight total in the whole history of this thing. Oh, but attempted murder, 17. Now listen to this. Bombing, 41. So they talk about, oh, that guy's a bomb abortion clinic. And look, I'm not advocating breaking the law. If you want to know what I think you should do, don't be a whore. Don't be a whoremonger. <laughs> Go to church, win souls, read your Bible. You know... It's a drop of water on a hot stove. You can't stop abortion. You know, what are you going to do? When they're killing 3,500 a day, you know, you just need to just win souls and God's going to punish them. And I'm not, I don't think we should punish them because God's going to punish them so much more than we can punish them anyway. Amen. So much more than I would even want to punish them. The horrific things that are going to happen to them are stuff that I wouldn't even wish upon anyone. But listen to this. They bombed 41 and only 8 died. And most of those didn't even die in the bombing. So it sounds like they're just bombing an empty building, doesn't it? I mean, if they blew up 41 and 8 died, and, and I know at least one of the 8 was, was a gunshot. The one in 2009 was, was shot as he was coming out of church. The guy who did partial birth abortion, Tiller, is that his name, Tiller? 
Tiller the killer? He was on his way out of church and some guy blew him away. That didn't even count the bombing. Okay? Now, you know, there's all these... And then it lists all the... the Email and internet harassment. Oh, see, it is in school. <laughs> Hold on a second, let me wipe the tears from my eyes. Hate mail and harassing phone calls. 14,661? I, I mean, I have more than that on my cell phone right now. Listen, you think I'm joking? I can literally, and look, this is every abortion clinic in America. I can literally pull out my, my smartphone and go into my Gmail account and show you thousands and thousands in a folder that I have entitled hate mail. And I think there's like, I think there's like 8,000 messages just in that one folder. I mean, come on. Oh, and then uh, picketing. Picketing. That's when somebody held up a sign in front of The bomb threat. 653 times. Listen to this. What about clinic blockades? This is where people did a blockade. This is like a peaceful protest. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. would be proud. You know? I mean, this is like Rosa Parks. Blockades, this is what they did. They did 764 blockades. Now, that's not per, per that's incidents of blockade. So that's counting all the people who link arms and block the door as one incident, 764. You know how many the police arrested? 33,834 people. So which side does it sound like the police is on? <laughs> yeah, so they can slaughter and murder 40-some million people over the last 30-some years, and then they actually arrested and took to jail 33,834 people for peacefully blocking the door saying, you're not going to kill anyone today. We will not allow you to kill babies today. Just today. Uh, you're under arrest. Book of Dano. This is the, you know, and then, and then people wonder why, and then people wonder why I don't lick the police's boots when they come around me. You know, we, we met some police officer the other day, and my wife kind of smarted off to him, and it's like, and they want, and you know, and he's just like, oh man, you know, because they're used to everybody licking their boots every time. Yeah. It's hard for me to respect somebody who has such a joke of a job that they're going around to serve and to protect. <laughs> They're going to protect everybody. It's like, while, while murder just runs rampant. Oh, but wait a minute. Were you, you were going 72 in a 70. <laughs> wait a minute. Is that marijuana I smell? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you peacefully protesting an abortion clinic by locking arms in front of it and forming a human blockade? You're under arrest. 33,000. Oh, there's just a few bad apples. Well, 33,000 cops. Not only did they do nothing about murder, and there is a law against murder, you know, and you say, well, but they, they, their hands are tied. Then get an honest job if you can't do your job right. Yeah. Amen. If your job is such a joke where you go around harassing Christians, harassing God's people, harassing people who are just trying to live their life and make a living and do an honest job. And uh, while, while you sit there and let murder go on, you let murder and, and, and wickedness go on. And then when somebody tries to do your stupid job for you and stand in front of the door and say, you're not going to kill anybody today, then you say, oh, you're under arrest. You go to jail. Makes me sick. Amen. I hope that no cop ever comes to this church ever. Amen. You make me sick, you Amen. joke. Get a real job. Don't tell me you're upholding the law. Whose law are you upholding? Bunch of thieves and reprobates. Bunch of perverts who run our country. Yeah. And you protect wickedness and you arrest 33,000 people who are doing the right thing. And you arrest a zero of the people who are wicked. I'm sorry. You say, I don't agree with that. Then, then go somewhere. Go to some church that will tell you everything's fine. Amen. I'm going to tell you the truth. Amen. I don't respect our government when it murders babies. And God's going to rip them up, and that's what the Bible says. You say, what should be our attitude toward the cry sheep? And see, these are my tears. That's why this is wet. I actually, I actually cried all over it. And you say, Pastor, aren't you afraid people are going to leave the church when you preach like You know what? Somebody somewhere has to get up and tell the truth. Amen. Thank you. Somebody has to do it. You're welcome. Because you know what? I wish somebody would have preached this way to me when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, when I was a young man. Amen. And you know what? Because somebody's got to get up and preach like the Bible preaches. 
And the Bible said, when a ruler hearkened to lies, all his servants are wicked. That's what the Bible says. They're all wicked. All the servants of the wicked system are wicked. That's what the Bible says. And so I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat this thing for you. If you want to get mad at somebody, don't get mad at the preacher who's foaming at the mouth and mad about people being arrested for just trying to peacefully stop murder. They're not even blowing anything up. They're just linking arms saying, no, we're not going to allow this in our area. And they're brought to jail by our loving police officers. Now listen to me. Instead of getting mad at me, why don't you get mad at the bloody-handed murderer? Why do you come and get mad at the prophet of God who says, thus saith the Lord, the children shall be dashed in pieces and the women with child shall be ripped up. Why do you get mad at him? Get mad at them. And if you're mad at me, then, then get mad at me and find little limp-wristed Baptists down the street. You'll be happier there. But the bottom line is, you're not going to hear this anywhere else. So you're going to hear it here tonight. Now, what should be my reaction toward this? And I'm tired, and I'm telling you right now, I need to get this off my chest. I'm sick and tired of people getting sad about when these abortion doctors get killed. Man. Now listen to me. Don't try to say that I'm condoning vigilantism or murder or violence. I, look at me. I'm 30 years old, and I've never laid a finger on anyone to harm anyone, except for when I was a teenager, I got into a few fist fights like everybody else. And I've never been in a fist fight since I was a teenager, okay? Unless it was like a sanctioned, you know, <laughs> boxing match or kickboxing match. That's sports, though. That's not yeah. fighting, right? Isn't that just a sport? Yeah. Amen. Okay. I've never, you know, laid a finger and harmed someone. I've never killed anybody. I've never shot anybody. I've never stabbed anybody. I've never even punched anybody since, like I said, just teenage scuffles. That's his part of growing up. Okay? <laughs> but anyway, and I'm not condoning of it. I'm just saying when you're a kid, you do dumb things and you get in fights over stupid things because you're a kid. Because you just don't, you know, you're foolish because you're a child. Foolish is bound to harm a child. So I'm not some violent individual here. I'm not telling anybody to go out and commit acts of violence. And that's how, that's how they'll try to always portray it. Like, yeah. you're trying to get people to kill. And <laughs> no, I'm, I'm totally nonviolent of a person. This is my weapon. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, they talk about, oh, they're taking our weapons, they're taking our gun. They can never take my weapon away. And you know what? Even if they take this physical book, you know what? You'll never take my weapon away. The only way to take my weapon away is to kill me. Because it's right here. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is right here and it's right here. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to remove this from my body before you've taken my weapons away. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. We wrestle with principalities against powers. It's the sword of the Spirit that's our weapon. I'm not condoning violence or telling anyone to go out and commit violence, but here's the honest truth. If you expect me to be sad when someone who has murdered thousands of babies, when somebody walks into their church and blows them away, if you want me to be sad about that, look elsewhere. Yeah. Because I say it good. I rejoice about it. Amen. Amen. Now look, here's the thing. Is it right... Are you in Psalm 137? Was it right for the children of Ammon to rip up the, the Israelite women that were with child? Was that right for them to do? No. Was that right for the soldiers of the children of Ammon to go in and rip up the women with child? Was it right for Hazael, the king of Syria? Remember when Elisha thought about it he started crying? Elisha, a grown man, a very tough man, when he thought about the women being ripped up, he began to cry. Was it right for the Syrians and the Ammonites to do that? No. But was it the judgment of God upon a wicked nation? Oh, yeah. Look what the Bible says in Psalm 137, verse 8. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Look at Psalm 58, verse 8. Psalm 58, verse 8. It says this, As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away, like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. Now look, did it say the righteous going to get sad when he sees the vengeance? No. And look, for example, and again, 
I'm not promoting violence. I never have. I never will. I don't believe in, in, in uh, going out and fighting and so forth. I believe in, in being peaceful. But you know what? When God judges the wicked, I don't feel bad about it. Now, let's, let me expose to you the hypocrisy of America. Are you ready for this? Yep. Remember when Osama bin Laden was shot? Yeah. Were people sad or were they rejoicing? They rejoiced. They rejoiced. Were they all fundamental Baptists that were rejoicing? Was it Christians? Was it right-wing Christians? Who was it? Everybody. It was everybody. everybody. Remember that? And everybody's on Facebook saying, Yeah, good! Yeah, he's dead! Yeah, they killed that sucker! Isn't that true? Yeah, Who saw saying. that on, on, on the Facebook or you heard that from your friends verbally? That's what everybody was saying. Oh, yeah, he's dead! Yeah, he's gone! Yeah! Even our government was saying, Yeah, he's dead! He's gone! And they rejoiced. They partied. People literally threw actual parties. I remember on that day, there were literal parties to celebrate the death of Osama bin Laden. But when the... And look, was Osama bin Laden a wicked person? Yeah, I'm sure he was. Of course he was. You know? But the thing is, but hold on a second. When an abortion doctor who, who specialized in late-term abortions... He specialized in partial birth abortion. He was one of the only ones in the nation who would perform partial birth abortions. And that's killing a baby after it's already been born. Okay, called a partial birth abortion because they just leave one part of it inside while they kill it. Think about how horrific. Yeah. And people say, oh, that's really sad. Or what about, or what, okay, okay, you, you like that? How about this? <laughs> you don't like that. How about this? What about... What about Gabrielle Giffords, the pro-abortion congressperson from down in Tucson? Oh, whether or not you agree with her politics or not, this is really sad that she got shot in the face. Hey, you know what? She has funded and promoted and voted for abortion with your tax dollars. Mm -hmm. And then somebody rips her up, and I'm supposed to get upset about it. I'm sorry. Do I condone of some psychopath? And the guy was a complete psycho. The guy was just firing randomly. He shot her and started just shooting everybody. He was just a psycho. The guy was completely out of his mind. He's just firing at random people. Let me tell you something. That is a punishment from God. I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, it's so sad. It's not sad. It's not sad at all. It's sad that she recovered. That's what's sad. Because now she can go take her crippled carcass into that Congress and vote for more abortion. And kill more babies. But you don't care about them, huh? You don't care about the babies. You don't care about our country. You don't care about life. You just care about Gabrielle. How's she doing? I don't care how she's doing. I give a rip how she's doing. She's going to burn in hell. She's going to split hell wide open. And if it's not today, it'll be tomorrow. And if it's not tomorrow, it'll be 10 years from now. And if it's not tomorrow, it'll be 20 years from now. And she will go to hell and burn there forever. So what's the difference if you went there yesterday or tomorrow? Yeah. It's going to be all eternity. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. Does that sound like sympathy? Does that sound like they feel bad about it? Does that sound like, oh, a crime he ever... He said, no, the righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a God that judgeth in the earth. And what did he say in verse 8? As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away. Like what? The untimely. Like the untimely birth of a woman. He's basically saying, let them die like an abortion. Let them die like a child that dies in its mother's womb. That's what an untimely birth is. You say, I'm never coming back. Good. That's why I gave it to you while you're here. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, dear God. And it was a sobering sermon tonight, not, not something pleasant. It's definitely not pleasant to think about, but it's biblical, and, and uh, we need to think about it. And, and I, I wouldn't be right with, with you, Lord, if I didn't preach the whole Bible. If I did like 99.9% .9 of preachers in this country who have never even read a verse about women being ripped up from behind the pulpit, have never even read a verse about children passing through the fire, have never even touched upon a verse about whoredoms, 
If I did like the 99% of preachers, God, I know I wouldn't be right with you, and that's all that matters, so I'll preach the word. And so thank you for people that love you and that are willing to listen. Help us all to see this through your eyes and to understand how it's murder, it's vile, it's abomination, and help us to keep ourselves clean and pure and godly and to have no fellowship with it, not to vote for it, not to be friends with it, not to promote it, but to be a total enmity with this kind of wickedness. Dear God, help us to live a clean, godly, and righteous life that's pleasing in your sight. And, and Father, the most important part of what I want to pray tonight is that, Father, when you punish our country, would you please just spare your people and spare us, spare me and my family, and spare the people that are here tonight, and spare the people that are under the sound of my voice, and please just protect your people when you punish the wicked, because I know you will punish them. Please just help us not to be uh, killed in the crossfire. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.